Welcome to our tutorial about identifying and addressing archival silences as you do research using Special Collections materials at USC. In this tutorial, we will provide you with an overview of what archival silences are, some underlying reasons on why they exist, and how you can address them in your research. What are archival silences? When we visit museums or libraries and archives, we often incorrectly assume that these places preserve history in its entirety. We don't take the time to think about how materials are selected to be added to these institutions, and we may believe that everybody and everything receives equal and unbiased treatment. We need to understand, however, that archives, libraries, and museums, like human beings, are not neutral and never have been. Thus, these institutions have the power to include or to exclude perspectives, narratives, voices, groups, events, and people from representation in their collections. When we experience this type of gap in representation, we are speaking of archival silences. As a result of archival silences, no museum, library, or archive documents history in its entirety. There are always parts or voices that are missing from it. Archival silences do not necessarily occur out of maliciousness, although they can, of course. There are many reasons why archival silences occur. Privilege is one of the reasons. Consider who can afford to collect materials that are later donated to a museum or library, or who would know that their collections and belongings could or should be preserved. Oftentimes, these are people who enjoy certain privileges because of their status in society. Have you asked yourself why special collections departments and rare books libraries often consist of books written by white people, often men, or about white people, often men? When you think about the role privilege and power plays in what ends up in a museum, library, or archive, it won't come as a surprise that most libraries and many museums tend to preserve the Western world view. Another aspect related to privilege is that certain types of materials are kept from destruction more than others. Think about it. Why do materials that belong to members of society that are more privileged and wealthy, for example, highly illuminated books of ours, tend to be preserved, while materials documenting everyday life and popular culture, such as maybe broadsides, are thrown away and lost? The fact is, that over time, the belongings of the upper classes were preserved more than those of people from a lower status in society. Wealthier people were often literate, owned expensive and sumptuous books, and had the means to preserve and pass on their belongings to their heirs. People of lower socioeconomic status with less financial means typically owned fewer and poor, poor quality materials. Often these individuals were illiterate, and we have less correspondence from and about them. Their unstable living conditions made it difficult for them to keep or preserve their belongings, which remains true today. The result is that the records created by the wealthy, the most educated, and the ones with the highest status in society have a much greater chance of surviving and being preserved. But privilege is only one possible reason that helps to create archival silences. Another factor is bias. We have to acknowledge that we all have biases, both conscious and unconscious. So when librarians or curators decide to acquire or accept one collection but not another, we are subconsciously applying our own biases to some degree. Consider for a moment the collector whose collection we accept for acquisition for the library. That collector also applied their biases in the selection of materials they added to their collection. One example for this is our starting a collection of the Los Angeles Women's March in 2016. While there were other historic moments in Los Angeles history at that time, librarians in USC Library Special Collections decided to document the LA Women's March, applying their own bias in the decision making. Bias is also evident in the way an institution chooses to represent itself to the outside. For example, during the first decades of establishing USC's university archives, we focused on collecting institutional records, as well as faculty papers and publications. Our student population was greatly underrepresented until a few years ago 
when we actively started to close these gaps in our collections by seeking materials on student life at USC and through starting collaborations with student organizations on campus to preserve their records. Another reason for an archival silence to occur is that the group we are trying to document has little or no material culture. For example, a few years ago, students in a class on Los Angeles history at USC wanted to research the homeless population in Venice Beach. Since the libraries did not own any materials on this topic, the professor created an assignment for the students to go to Venice Beach and collect materials that document the homeless living there. The students did not find a single item created by someone from the homeless community and only one item that documented the homeless in Venice Beach. Instead, they found plenty of flyers and ephemera for vegan ice cream places, restaurants serving organic food, etc. The only relevant item found was a flyer posted at a bus stop notifying the homeless population that any belongings remaining at that bus stop would be disposed of by a specific date. There are other reasons why evidence of material culture is missing. For example, because the material culture consisted of perishable material, or because all material culture was destroyed by enemies. These examples show us that the lack of physical evidence in a museum, library, or archive does not prove that events did not happen or the people did not exist. So how should you address archival silences in your research? First, you'll need to acknowledge that they exist. When working with primary source materials in special collections, make sure that you do not limit your analysis to the materials that you come across in our collections. Sometimes it can be more important to ask yourself the following questions. What is missing? Whose perspectives are not represented? And what could be the reasons for those archival silences? Also, check if you can find evidence of the missing perspectives elsewhere, for example, collected by another archive or through a community organization. Lastly, whenever you use primary source materials, remember that you are the researcher and remember to critically reflect about the materials in front of you. Also, make sure to address any archival silences you encounter. Librarians and archivists acknowledge that we too have to play our part to help overcome archival silences. Over the last decade, special collections departments across the US have realized that many stories have not yet been told, and many people, especially people from marginalized communities, have been represented falsely or negatively, or not represented at all in our collections. As a result, we at USC Library Special Collections have begun to reflect on the ways we select collections and materials for acquisition, in an effort to increase inclusion of underrepresented communities and diversity in our collections. This will not eradicate all archival silences in our collections, but it is a first and important step. Thank you for watching this tutorial. We hope you feel well prepared for your visit to the Special Collections Reading Room. If you have any questions or need research assistance, do reach out to us by email at specol at usc.edu. For more information on how to search, request, access, and analyze primary source materials at USC, please check out our other tutorials. Thank you.